Okay, we'll get started. Good morning. I want to welcome all of you to the 27th Rena Schechter Memorial Lecture. You know, you've heard about uh, Rena before. She used to be a St. Louis native and did a lot of things for the St. Louis community, including uh, the Missouri Botanical Gardens. And she died of pancreatic cancer. And uh, after that, this lectureship was started by her husband, Sam Schechter, who used to be on faculty here for a number of years. And he has established a number of research fellowships and professorship. And uh, we want to thank uh, the Schechter family for supporting this lecture. And we've always invited people who have done seminal work in the field of cancer research, and today is no exception. It's a special privilege to introduce my dear friend, Charlie Rudin, who is the, uh, in my opinion, represents the best of physician scientists in, uh, in cancer <laughs> research or all of uh, medical research. And he really has done a fantastic job of you know, seamlessly transitioning from the bench to bedside back to the bench, and you will see that in his work. He is currently the Sylvia Hassenfeld Professor and Chief of Thoracic Oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and is the Deputy Director of the Cancer Center. And I've known Charlie for over 20 years, and we have jointly worked on a number of projects. Small cell lung cancer is a shared passion for both of us. And in early days, Charlie worked on hedgehog signaling and uh, did some seminal work that led to the approval of a novel agent in a, in a cancer not related to small cell lung cancer called medulloblastoma, and he did the great work at the time. And then over the past 20 years, his research has been largely focused on small cell lung cancer. He did the very, one of the very first studies on sequencing the small cell lung cancer in the early days when the sequencing was still very novel and did a whole exome uh, sequencing in small cell lung cancer that really mapped out all the genomic alterations in small cell lung cancer. He also did the very first single cell sequencing of small cell lung cancer and has identified some of the transcription factors that play a key role in the sensitivity and the resistance of small cell lung cancer. And over the past few years, he has uh, found some novel biomarkers, particularly the biomarkers uh, involved in DNA repair, Schroffen 11 and in relation to some of the factors like EZS2 and others that potentially could be turned into therapeutic targets. So Charlie's work is going to be transformative and currently has really changed our thinking of how we approach small cell lung cancer. And his work most recently on a target called DLL3, delta like ligand 3 has really played a major role in bringing forth what is going to be one of the new agents likely to be approved very soon um, using uh, bispecific uh, antibodies. And uh, so his work is affecting the lives of our patients. And I think uh, he is, uh, his research will continue to impact um, the, in the cancer research for a number of years. As you can imagine, Charlie has been funded by a number of peer-reviewed grants, including the prestigious R35 for given to exceptional physician scientists. And uh, we have a few of them, like John and Tim here, and uh, Charlie in that rank, the August rank of those people. And um, uh, Charlie's papers have been cited over 50,000 times, and um, he has published over 350 papers, and his H index is 111. For reference, my H index is two, so that tells you how different Charlie is. So with great pleasure, Charlie, welcome to St. Louis. So thank you, Govind, and it is a pleasure to be here, and uh, you know, uh, imposter syndrome is real, uh, you know, and uh, uh, it doesn't hit me that often anymore, but, but when I see Govind and I remember our old days when we were both uh, young uh, Turks in Chicago and really trying to make a name for ourselves uh, as trainees, and it's still, when I see him, I sort of feel like we're playing, playing at being big roles, but uh, uh, it's great to see Govind and old friends and, and uh, great to be here, so it's a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to talk about small cell lung cancer today, um, and this is a talk that I haven't given before, uh, so bear with me. I'm going to present actually a lot of data that is not published um, because I think it's more interesting to do that, and, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I realize this is medicine grand round, so I'm going to start out with uh, sort of a little bit of background on a small cell lung cancer so everyone's oriented, and then we'll kind of delve into some, some of the newer stories that we're working on. 
So small cell lung cancer, you all know, is an incredibly aggressive form of lung cancer. It represents about 15% of all lung cancers. Its incidence is actually decreasing, at least in the United States, as we uh, uh, have uh, decreased incidence of smoking. It's probably the cancer that is most associated with heavy tobacco exposure. Uh, these tend to be centrally located tumors. They have neuroendocrine features, which I'll talk about a, a fair bit. Very strong uh, metastatic predilection. Two-thirds of the cases are metastatic at diagnosis. Super proliferative tumors. They have a, a KI-67 that's, uh, you know, uh, very, very high. All the cells are in, in cycle. They tend to overgrow their blood supplies. These are necrotic tumors. Very lethal. Where do they metastasize? Of course, they start in the lung, lymph nodes, liver, adrenals, bone, and brain. They do have a strong predilection for brain. This may be part of their neuroendocrine features. And actually, there's a lot of cells in the blood, you know, the, and um, it's probably the tumor type that has the highest level of circulating tumor cells among the solid tumors. Uh, and we've actually used that productively to generate models. You can uh, take blood from patients and actually generate xenografts directly uh, from blood. Where are we in small cell lung cancer today? If we look back, you know, uh, mm, uh, 15 years or so, this was a trial looking at uh, uh, two different chemotherapy regimens, both platinum doublets, either with etoposide or arenotecan. You can see no difference between them, and both of these curves are really going to ground very uh, sharply. And this is a more recent trial updated in 2022 uh, with the addition of a PDL1 immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitor. And you can see that there's a tail on the curve. There are long term survivors here, um, not many. Not nearly as many as there are for, say, non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, renal cell cancer. But the difference is real. There's about a tripling of three-year survival here. This is progress, but it's nowhere near where we would want to be. Uh, as given and noted, uh, back in the day, we had done one of the early genomic profilings of small cell lung cancer. This is a more, uh, slightly more recent figure from 2020. Uh, 15 from, from Julie George, looking at the genomic landscape of small cell lung cancer. I just want to highlight that P53 and RB are almost universally inactivated in small cell lung cancer, and the loss of these two key tumor suppressor genes that you know are, are involved in controlling cell cycle and controlling DNA damage repair pathways and, and allowing for repair to be activated are, are inactivated in small cell lung cancer. This really sets up the tumor for the uh, incredibly high proliferative rate and instability uh, of this tumor type. Um, there's a number of other mutations that are, that are commonly seen, uh, but the mutational landscape doesn't really divide the tumor into discrete um, subtypes. We, we tried to subtype small cell lung cancer, and this was a sort of a consensus paper of laboratory investigators, clinical investigators coming together to try to uh, categorize small cell lung cancer into categories not based on mutational profiles, which as I showed you are sort of universal, P53 and RB and activation, but rather based on RNA, based on gene expression, and in particular, the differential expression of some master transcriptional regulators, ASCL1, NeuroD1, POW2F3. This fourth subset um, uh, designated here as YAP1, in fact, is sort of heterogeneous. It does seem to be a little bit more inflamed, maybe a little bit more responsive to immunotherapy. Uh, I think this has helped to sort out the tumors, uh, at least in theory. Uh, I would say, as we were discussing last night over dinner, this hasn't really led to differences in how we approach this clinically yet, but I do think this is something real and something to keep an eye on. I would say these are not subtypes in the sense of EGFR and KRAS. They're not really different tumors. These are states, and the tumors are plastic, and they can migrate from one state to the other, and certainly on a single cell level, we've shown that multiple states are present within a given within a given tumor. All right, so as I said, the large majority of, of uh, small cell lung cancers are associated with tobacco use. 
uh, that is the driver of, of this disease largely, but there are rare cases that are not associated with tobacco exposure. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about those today. There's also a subset that is associated with tobacco exposure, but that has P53 and RB actually wild type. And for a while, we didn't believe these were really wild type. But um, you know, studies by our pathologists and, and others, uh, we're pretty convinced these actually are truly RB wild type. They have other mutations that probably lead to uh, deficiencies in these same pathways. Uh, I won't talk about this work today, but this was really led by a pathology fellow, uh, Chris Febres, uh, in, in our group, together with uh, a pathology colleague that I work very closely with, Natasha Reckman, to sort of sort out that part of the population. The never smokers, a rare population of uh, patients with small cell lung cancer, some of these are transformed small cell lung cancer, and you've probably heard about this pathway of, of lineage plasticity, uh, histologic transformation where you have an adenocarcinoma that actually transforms into a high-grade neuroendocrine tumor. This happens in prostate cancer under selective pressure of drugs like enzalutamide, uh, highly efficient, you know, androgen uh, pathway inhibitors. It happens in lung cancer under selective inhibition by target inhibitors as well. And one of the stories I'm going to tell you about is these atypical small cell lung cancers that are P53 RB wild type and that are in never smokers. Uh, and this is really a new, uh, path, uh, a new path that we think about. So first, the lineage plasticity idea. You know, in normal lung development, there's a differentiation of lung progenitors down pathways. This, this essentially is replicated, and, and um, these pathways are reused by tumors to generate adenocarcinoma, to generate small cell lung cancer. And there is um, the ability of tumors to sort of hop over <coughs> the, 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 the hump, so to speak, to transform from adenocarcinoma to small cell lung cancer as a mechanism of escape from targeted inhibitors. And as I said, this is not unique to lung cancer. This happens in prostate cancer. It happens in a lot of cancers, actually. And I think the more we develop really good therapies for adenocarcinomas, whether they're adenocarcinomas of the breast, lung, prostate, other uh, adenos, we're going to see escape down this <coughs> sort of um, uh, pathway of, of differentiation into high-grade neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, we're seeing this sort of across the board. The loss of these two key tumor suppressors seems to be required or, or uh, strongly enforces the, the capacity for tumors to go down this pathway. We initially looked at this together with Jeff Engelman uh, back in, in 2015, looking at adenocarcinomas with EGFR mutations uh, transforming into small cell lung cancer, showing that, that uh, these tended to lose RB actually in advance of transformation to small cell lung cancer. A and at uh, Sloan Kettering, we've taken a look in particular at EGFR mutant adenocarcinomas that have in the adenocarcinoma detectable P53 and RB loss. These triple mutant adenocarcinomas are at very high risk uh, for lineage plasticity transformation <coughs> to small cell lung cancer. They have a very poor outcome, as you might imagine. Uh, when we look back at the adenocarcinomas that have transformed to small cell lung cancer, P53 and RB loss is detectable in the adenocarcinoma essentially in 100% of those cases. So this is the group that's really at highest risk. And, and we've developed some clinical trials to try to intervene on this triple mutant population in advance to prevent transformation. So far, unsuccessful, I have to say, but, but it's still an area of real interest. So understanding this transformation from adenocarcinoma to small cell lung cancer, one of the approaches that we've taken, you know, adenocarcinoma being sort of a, a, a slow ride in the park and, and small cell lung cancer being a highly aggressive proliferative tumor, uh, we went back to the pathologist and said, you know, what about these mixed histology tumors that we see in pathology that have adenocarcinoma and small cell lung cancer are on the same slide. You know, this may essentially represent a reaction intermediate, a transformation in progress where these tumors are not only physically proximal but actually temporally proximal 
in terms of their development. And, and by studying these reaction intermediates, these mixed histology tumors, could we learn a little bit more about this uh, lineage plasticity and transformation? So this is what we did. This is led by Alvaro Quintanal Villalonga, a, a, a postdoc in, in my lab. Again, we went to pathology. We looked for tumors where there was clear adenocarcinoma and small cell lung cancer, mixed histology tumors, where these were actually discrete areas of the slide where we could do microdissection and isolate these components, and then we profiled them across every kind of omic platform we could think about. I'm not going to go through those data. This is all published a couple of years ago now, but um, we essentially looked at adenocarcinomas that never transformed pre-transformation adenocarcinomas that were cases that ultimately transformed post-transformation cases and de novo small cell lung cancer, and then looked at these mixed histology tumors, the adeno and the small cell lung cancer components separately. A and by doing this sort of pathway analysis, we can at least line up uh, what we think are some of the key uh, changes that have to happen in the, pr in the progression of these tumors into small cell lung cancer. This actually nominates a number of key transcription factors that are also uh, implicated in the same transformation in prostate cancer, POW3F2, 1COT2, FOXN4, WINT uh, expression, the PRC2 complex driven by the uh, enzymatic component EZR, EZH2, uh, and a number of pathways here that we think play into this, uh, including MYC, which is actually not, not shown here. Same sort of party trick we did with adenosquamous to look for transformation on that axis. It's a less dramatic transformation, but it's another mechanism of escape from EGFR mutant tumors uh, for, uh, from an EGFR mutant, uh, EGFR uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Some of the same pathways actually come up in that transformation. We think of these as sort of licensing factors, that, that MYC upregulation may actually permit the tumors to undergo this sort of histologic shift uh, and change in biology. More recently, we've, we've sort of dug into factors that we think might be targetable uh, in this progression. Because, of course, we don't just want to understand that it happens. We want to actually intervene on it. So uh, we constructed a CRISPR screen. This is actually not published at all, but, but in submission now, using a, a, a druggable genome library. So we took every gene in the genome for which there is a protein, which is either uh, the target of an existing drug or a uh, tool compound in development as a drug, uh, and did a focused screen, not looking for any gene in the genome, but really looking for druggable targets that might be of interest in this process of, of transformation. One of the genes that pops out of there uh, quite strongly is a gene called CDC7. This is a gene that we know the protein is involved in DNA damage repair, in um, replication fork resolution. Uh, it seemed to be, you know, something that would be of interest, particularly in this genomically unstable tumor type that we know has defects in, in DNA damage repair. Um, CDC7 turns out to be upregulated in the process of transformation. If we look across the spectrum of transforming adenocarcinoma, transforming small cell and then small cell, similarly upregulated in prostate neuroendocrine cancers. So uh, across uh, uh, another data set, uh, looking at prostate versus neuroendocrine prostate, um, and again, uh, at both the protein and the RNA level, we see this upregulation preceding the transformation from adenocarcinoma to small cell lung cancer in both of these tumor systems. And if we knock out in adenocarcinoma, P53, RB, or both, we see upregulation of CDC7. Any database we look at, we sort of see this, this gene pop out as, as highly statistically significant associated with P53 and RB loss. And when we knock it out, uh, or when we inhibit it with a drug, um, uh, Simulacertib, which is a, a, a CDC7 inhibitor, uh, we can actually downregulate all the pathways that, that we think are associated with lineage plasticity. I'm showing you here prostate cancer models with P53 and RB knocked out, or a lung adenocarcinoma um, treated with 
uh, effective therapy for prostate cancer, enzalutamide or uh, osimertinib, uh, a, a TKI for EGFR in lung cancer. When we treat with these inhibitors alone, we see these tumors begin to express uh, neuroendocrine uh, transformation uh, phenotypes, including upregulation of MYC, uh, as shown here consistently across these models. We also see upregulation of a variety of pathways. All of this is suppressed completely uh, by uh, uh, CBC7 inhibitors. So all of these pathways that we've shown are associated with lineage plasticity are shut off in both prostate and, and lung. Uh, so we think these may be, this may be a pathway to actually constrain the capacity for transformation, which, 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 which would potentially lead to more durable responses to targeted inhibitors. And we've shown this now in, in some of the uh, models, for example, here, the, the prostate cancer models. When we treat these uh, double mutant, double knockout prostate models with uh, enzalutamide, we see a little bit of response, but the tumors break through with neuroendocrine transformation, upregulation of chromogranin, upregulation of, of synaptophysin, downregulation of, of the antigen receptor. When we give the CDC7 inhibitor not a lot of effect on its own, but the combination keeps these tumors in adenocarcinoma form and uh, relatively responsive to the targeted inhibitors. It's worth just taking a step back and looking at this process of transformation and thinking about how this actually happens. You know, how do tumors jump over from adeno to, to small cell lung cancer? Do they really uh, sort of uh, uh, do this sort of transformation directly, or is this really a selection phenotype where you're inhibiting a stem cell that's able to differentiate into adenocarcinoma and instead it, it adopts a different pathway? I think both of these are entirely possible. I would say at the single cell level when we've looked at adenocarcinoma, and this is a, a paper that came out a few years ago together with Juan Masage's lab. Within adenocarcinomas, although these tumors look differentiated, there are very early progenitors at the single cell level present in, in lung adenocarcinomas within the lung that really represent the earliest uh, stages of lung development where there's budding of the early airway, these SOX17 positive cells, and, and there's a progression uh, of cells along a differentiation pathway that's entirely reflective of normal lung development. So there's real stem cells in, the, in these tumors. So I think selection may be an important pathway here. All right, the second story I want to tell, and again, this is a totally unpublished one, is, is about lung cancer that evolves in never smokers. That's actually P53 and RB wild type. And, and we got interested in this initially because of a 19-year-old college student who came to us, never smoker, brain met, presented with seizure, you know, brain met was resected, it's a small cell lung cancer. How did this kid have a small cell lung cancer? It just didn't seem right. And, and uh, he also had a big lung mass, and we took the, a biopsy of that, and it was a, a carcinoid, but genomically related to the lung cancer in the brain. And carcinoids, as you may know, these are low-grade neuroendocrine tumors. They don't have anything to do with small cell lung cancer. We think of them as totally different. Tumors, they're not tobacco associated, they're, they tend to be surgically cured. Uh, so this, this case intrigued us and we, we began looking for these cases. We found about 20 of these cases among the first, you know, 600 small cell lung cancers that we had genomically profiled. <coughs> we found 20 that sort of met the criteria of being never smokers, lacking P53 and RB commutation. And together with Natasha and, and, and a group shown here, we began to profile these in terms of, uh, uh, again, sort of every platform we could think of to try to figure out what's going on with these uh, tumor types. So this is that signature patient, brain met, super high KS67, small cell lung cancer histology, classic. But then he also has this, a big tumor that has low KS67. This is a carcinoid. And when we look at these, 20 cases, interestingly, we, we pretty consistently see features of carcinoid, even though these patients are diagnosed pathologically 
with small cell lung cancer. So we see MEN1 mutations, multiple endocrine neoplasia 1, this is associated with carcinoid. Other gene mutations associated with carcinoid, we see markers for carcinoid. And some of these cases actually had tumors that were biopsied that were carcinoid and that were all genomically related to the small cell lung cancer in the same patient. So genomically, what these tumors have is a very different pathway of evolution. So tobacco-related carcinogenesis, you see tons of mutations across the genome and, and you inactivate things like PP3 and RB. These tumors have a completely different mechanism of, uh, a different etiologic mechanism, which is chromothripsis. So this is a sort of catastrophic uh, uh, rearrangement of, of chromosomes. Uh, and, and you can see here in these circus plots the sort of incredibly dense rearrangements that are occurring between chromosome loci uh, in these tumor types. We're seeing this pretty recurrently with chromosome 11, chromosome 12, chromosome 3 being frequent pairs. Every time we see 11, we see 3. We don't know why, but these always seem to go together. And within these chromothriptic chromosomes, we see certain genes that get amplified that are of interest to us because they actually functionally mimic P53 and RB deficiency. So uh, cyclin D1, cyclin D2, cyclin, uh, CDK4. MDM2 in activating P53, we see very high amplification of MIC-L in, in some of these tumors. And, and just to emphasize the extent of chromosomal rearrangements that are occurring here, when we focus in on the chromosomes that are actually affected by this chromothriptic process, it's really just end-to-end, stem-to-stern. The whole chromosome is just getting completely shredded uh, and rearranged. Uh, these are really quite, to us, seem like pretty dramatic events. We can visualize this in a number of ways. One is with a program called Fast Hits where we can see this sort of juggling among copy numbers and then this, these focal amplifications of these, uh, of these key genes, again, cyclin D1, cyclin D2, MDM2, and, and CDK4. Uh, this is another way of sort of displaying the same thing, looking at uh, interchromosomal rearrangements uh, that are occurring here. Uh, we think that these are occurring in an extra chromosomal way, um, and, and we know that because we see sort of these uh, uh, amplifications to the same extent across certain oncogenes that are occurring in different parts of the chromosome. A and uh, we sort of focus uh, on this uh, in part by looking at fish. So when we do a, a, a metaphase spread, you can then probe with fish with uh, for um, those oncogenes that are selectively amplified. So uh, again, cyclin D2 here, MBM2, CDK4, these are all um, co-localized. And you can see there are these circles that get that massively amplified, and the amplifications are not in the chromosomes, they're actually extra chromosomal. So we think that the nucleus is actually filled with these little circles of drivers. Um, that are really driving these tumor types. So how does this happen? This happens, and, and this is not our work, this is sort of known, uh, by chromosome uh, missegregation. You get chromosomes that are lagging in, in, um, in the process of mitosis. These get uh, exported into a little micronucleus, and then these get completely shredded and, and rearranged in the micronucleus. At the next cell cycle, they can be reintegrated into the genome. Some of these get uh, uh, re-ligated into chromosomes, but some of them get re-ligated into extra chromosomal circles and then can amplify to high levels with, with selection. How do these tumors do? They do intermediate, as you might expect. They're, they're somewhere between atypical carcinoids, these low-grade tumors, and small cell lung cancer. They're very different than the small cell lung cancer that go histologic transformation from adenocarcinoma. So the red curve here is the typical smoking-related small cell lung cancer. The orange curve is small cell lung cancer in never smokers that comes from adenocarcinoma, lineage plasticity transformation. These are these atypical small cell lung cancers, intermediate in terms of prognosis. They're young. They tend to be quite young, some of them in their 20s. They have 
a little bit lower Ks67 uh, proliferation index, they have very low tumor mutation burden. They actually don't have many mutations at all. Um, they have chromothripsis, but they have rearrangements, but they do not have mutations. When we look at uh, tobacco signatures, of course, we don't see it in the adenocarcinomas, the EGFR mutant adenocarcinomas that go to small cell lung cancer. We also do not see it in these uh, never smokers with, with uh, transformed atypical small cell lung cancer in contrast to the smokers. They do not have APABEC mutagenesis, which is the driver of, of the mutagenesis that occurs in lineage plasticity. And when we look at these subtypes, they're really locked in to the uh, ASCL1 dependent uh, subtype. Every single one of them so far has been 100% ASCL1, no expression of neuro D1, no expression of POP2F3, no expression of YAP1. Uh, so they really seem like a distinct entity. So we think this is actually maybe a new pathway. It's a rare pathway, but I think a really interesting one. We think there's sort of two pathways by which never smokers can develop high-grade neuroendocrine lung cancers resembling small cell lung cancer. One, the pretty well-studied now pathway from adenocarcinoma to small cell lung cancer. This occurs with selective pressure of, say, an EGFR TKI. Tumors undergo APABEC-mediated mutagenesis. I didn't really walk you through all of that. They have P53 and RB loss, well-studied. This is a new pathway, rare, but I think really interesting, a different type of lineage plasticity, now related not to adeno, but to carcinoid, where carcinoid tumors undergo chromothriptic chromosomal catastrophes that lead to these uh, 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 small circles with oncogene amplifications. Um, mimicking P53 and RB mutation and leading to uh, a similar tumor. So those are some new pathways to small cell lung cancer. This is still, of course, the dominant highway. This is the uh, pretty well-studied lineage plasticity pathway, and right now this is just a garden path, but we're, we're really interested in it as, as a mechanism. So what do we do now? So what, 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 have, what are some paths to better outcomes? How are we doing on time? Good. All right, so there's been a lot of trials looking at the new paradigm of adding a PDL1 inhibitor, a PD1 inhibitor to small cell lung cancer. There's actually more trials than I've shown you here now um, with some, some newer ones, but essentially all of these trials, over 3,000 patients with small cell lung cancer, basically looking at platinum doublet plus or minus a PDL1 inhibitor. You know, what, what have we really learned? Uh, from these from these mini trials, uh, a lot of them being Me Too trials. Well, one thing, as I pointed out at the beginning, immunotherapy can work. Uh, there's actually a flattening of the curve here. There's durable responses here. There are rare, super rare patients with small cell lung cancer who are really long-term disease-free survivors with metastatic disease. Um, this is real, so it can work. But, but it usually doesn't. You know, the median improvement in survival here is only a couple of months. So uh, the vast majority of these patients are basically immunologically unresponsive. The responses can be durable even off therapy. So one of the trials that, that I led was this one, the Keynote 604 trial, they actually a negative trial for survival, just missed its endpoint. But I think its curves are very similar to the others. On this trial, patients received up to two years of Pembro, but if they s were still doing well at that point, they actually stopped uh, immunotherapy. And there are still long-term survivors here. Um, so if we look at those patients who completed two years of pembrolizumab, a minority of the patients, uh, but most of them continue to be alive two years later. So far, uh, blocking more T cell checkpoints has been totally abysmally negative. So this was the Caspian trial that, that showed that dervalumab can add to the chemotherapy backbone. If you add another T cell checkpoint, CTLA-4, here targeted with Tremolumumab, you don't get any additional benefit. You get more toxicity, actually if numerically worse outcome. So that really didn't add anything. The other trial that showed that it really didn't add anything was, was again, one that I unfortunately led, which was this trial looking at uh, addi addition of uh, TIGIT inhibitor, another T cell checkpoint, 
no, no additional benefit uh, targeting uh, this pathway. So why doesn't hitting the T cell harder work? And, and what can we do to actually raise the tail of this curve to bring the potentially transformative benefit of immunotherapy to a larger fraction of our patients with small cell lung cancer? Why are 90% of these tumors so immunotherapy resistant? Well, one of the reasons that I think small cell lung cancer is so immunologically unresponsive to CD8-positive T-cell-directed immunotherapies is because small cell lung cancer tends to downregulate class one presentation. You know the MHC class one uh, protein complex is required for, T for, for any cell in your body to present to CD8-positive T-cells. So, antigen is presented in the, in the context of MHC class 1 to cytolytic T cells, CD8 positive T cells. If a tumor downregulates uh, MHC class 1, it may be more susceptible to NK cell lysis, but it is entirely refractory to CD8 positive T cell uh, engagement. This seems to be a common pathway of escape for small cell lung cancer. So we were really interested in trying to define how could we upregulate small cell lung cancer uh, MHC class 1. I'll point out this pathway is not mutated in small cell lung cancer. So again, looking at the MSK impact database, we now have, I don't know, 700 small cell lung cancer sequenced. 4% have a mutation in this pathway. So it's almost never mutated. It seems to be epigenetically silenced. So Evelyn and Goyen was a grad student in the lab, began to look at epigenetic targets that might upregulate class 1. And just, you know, initially doing some in, in silico data mining, she, she looked at LSD1 encoded by the KDM1A gene, super highly upregulated in small cell lung cancer, higher expressed in small cell than any other tumor type, and most interestingly, anti-correlated with expression of all the HLA genes, beta-2 microglobulin, the TAP proteins, all the, all the genes that are involved in class 1 antigen presentation pathway. So she began playing with LSD1 inhibition a, as a strategy. If we inhibit LSD1 either genetically using shRNA or pharmacologically, you can see in small cell models we get uh, marked upregulation, re-expression of the MHC class 1 alleles, beta-2 microglobulin. This works if we give a drug. We see MHC class 1 on the cell surface, which we can show by flow cytometry. Uh, and we don't just see class 1. We actually see upregulation. These are two small cell lung cancer cell lines of a whole series of, of genes that are involved in class 1 presentation, uh, antigen processing and presentation. The, the MHC alleles themselves go up. Peptide loading complex uh, uh, machinery goes up. The proteasome goes up. And this whole pathway of interferon signaling gets markedly induced when we give an LSD1 inhibitor. If we look by uh, gene pathways, you know, the top pathway that comes out when we give an LSD1 inhibitor is antigen processing and presentation. And she could show in this uh, 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 experiment that, that actually you get class 1 presentation when you give an ECH, when you, when you give an LSD1 inhibitor to small cell lung cancer cell lines. So these are three lines that have an allele that can present uh, NYE so if you take small cell lung cancer and mix it with T cells in, in tissue culture and put in the NYE so uh, peptide, uh, cells don't respond. You don't get any lysis of the small cell, but if you give an LST1 inhibitor, all of a sudden now that peptide causes lysis. That means it's sitting in the MHC class 1, and the T cells recognizing it and causing lysis. This is a control. This is a cell line that actually lacks the appropriate MHC allele to present. Uh, so this shows us that, that this upregulates. And in fact, in vivo, she can show that you get upregulation of tumor in MHC class 1, upregulation of PDL1, a marker of sort of tumor inflammation. You get Inflammation, you get infiltration with, uh, with uh, T cells, CD8 positive T cells, and these are activated T cells. And even in GEM models, which have very little mutation burden, we can show combinatorial efficacy of uh, PDL1 together with uh, an LSD1 inhibitor. So this was really interesting to us. This is all in human tumors in mice. 
we were interested, can we see this in, you, you know, real human tumors? Um, you know, and so we sort of started looking for a, a database where we could actually look at this. Uh, one of the confounders in all those first-line trials that I showed you is all the patients get chemo with immunotherapy, so it's hard to tease out the, the impact of immunotherapy alone. So we, we looked for a trial where, where we were giving IO therapy alone, and, and Matt Hellman in our shop had, had helped to lead this trial, the Checkmate 032 trial. This was one of these complicated trials, sort of a, uh, you know, uh, octopus trial with a million arms that, you know, did all kinds of things. But there were two uh, cohorts of small cell lung cancer patients treated either with nivolumab alone, PD-L1 inhibitor, or nivolumab with ipilimumab, a CPLA4 inhibitor. A lot of patients, 400 patients with recurrent metastatic small cell lung cancer in this trial. We went to BMS and asked, you know, to look at the RNA-seq data from these, and actually a lot of the patients, over 70 percent, had available uh, uh, biospecimens that, that passed QC for, for RNA. So we actually had a lot of tumors to look at here to look to see does MHC class 1 presentation actually correlate with benefit, and it seems to. So looking at this uh, pathway of antigen processing and presentation, if we look at nivolumab or nivolumab, ipilimumab treated patients, you can see the top curve here is uh, patients whose RNA signature from the tumor uh, demonstrates high, relatively high expression of antigen presentation machinery. Again, if we look at keg pathway analysis, the top pathway in the human data that comes out is antigen processing and presentation. Tumor inflammation correlates with expression of this antigen pre uh, presentation machinery signature. And if we break this down into the component genes that are in this antigen processing and presentation pathway, all of these genes are, are coordinately regulated. And this, to me, was the most striking data. If we look at expression across this tumor uh, panel of beta-2 microglobulin, the TAP proteins, HLA, A, B, and C, they're all co-regulated one-to-one. -one. You know, there, there's clearly not a mutational mechanism here. There's an epigenetic mechanism here that is co-regulating this entire pathway uh, as sort of uh, a unit. What if we look at the single gene that, that uh, Evelyn had come up with a, as a potential regulator, LST1? Again, this seems to pop out of the human data sets. Those tumors that have low expression of LST1 seem to derive selective benefit from immunotherapy, suggesting that one strategy would be to take these tumors that have, low, that have high expression of uh, LSD1, could we suppress it with an LSD1 inhibitor and maybe, again, raise the tail of that curve. And this is a concept that Noura Chaudhuri, one of our, our uh, junior faculty, is taking forward in, in an NCI-supported trial. Very simple idea. Everyone gets chemo IO, first line. In maintenance, we give a PDL1 inhibitor. The patients drop off pretty quickly. What if we give an LSD1 inhibitor? What if we try to upregulate class 1 in this context to get the tumors to actually respond to immunotherapy? This is a trial that will be coming forward uh, through, uh, through CTEP uh, and should be actually activating in the next, in the next month. Um, so if you're interested. <laughs> Sites will be will will be looking for for partners across the country to do that. So, what are some other strategies? You know, uh, this strategy failed, hitting the T cell harder, and I think that's because if if MHC class one isn't on the cell surface, it doesn't matter how hard you hit the CD8 positive T cell, you're not going to get any more responses. This strategy, linking the T cell to the tumor using a bi-specific antibody, does show efficacy. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of that data. Epigenetic priming, I talked to you about LSD1 as, as a primary target here. EZH2, I think, is an equally good target here, and there are other strategies uh, as well. I'm going to turn a little bit to uh, another target, DLL3, which we're really interested in. Uh, Kravindan mentioned this. Uh, this is a paper from a number of years ago. This was analysis done by JT Poirier, who was a postdoc in my lab and then and the lab co-director for, for a period of time. JT had looked at the cell surface proteome of small cell lung cancer, looking for targets that are kind of uniquely expressed on small cell lung cancer that are really not expressed in other 
tissues of the body, and DLL3 comes out at the top of this list as a really unique target. We started collaborating with the group at Stemcentrics on developing uh, uh, what they had developed, an anti-DLL3 antibody drug conjugate. Uh, we talked about this over dinner. This did not work well uh, as a single agent um, uh, 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 because uh, there was really, really bad toxicity associated with the warhead. But I think that trial did validate DLL3 as a, a therapeutic target. And since then, there's been a lot of interest in these bispecific T cell engagers as a strategy. And there's a lot of different structures for these. But basically, the idea is you bind DLL3, you bind T cells, you just bring T cells into close proximity with the tumor. They get activated, you know, release cathepsin and other factors and, and lead to tumor lysis. And we're seeing real activity with these drugs. The one that's farthest along is tarlatumab. We've been playing a lot with the harpoon drug um, at, at Memorial, but I think these are all very similar in terms of strategy. These are data that, that uh, not our data, but uh, data that has recently emerged, published in the New England Journal, looking at tarlatumab response in patients with recurrent small cell lung cancer. Response rate is about 40%. I think what's impressed us the most is, is, is that there is some durability here. We don't have many drugs in small cell lung cancer that have, we don't have any other drugs, I would say, that have uh, for recurrent disease a median progression through survival of over, uh, of, of this long, uh, so uh, median overall survival of a year. Um, these, this is actually looking like probably a real, a real drug. We see similar promising data with the harpoon by specific, this has actually just been, the whole company has been bought by Merck now. Um, we see not only in small cell lung cancer, but other neuroendocrine tumors like neuroendocrine prostate cancer, we see responses. The other strategy that I think has uh, gotten a lot of press lately and that's sort of hot in small cell lung cancer has been antibody drug conjugates, and there's a number of targets for these. Antibody drug conjugates have sort of exploded uh, as a field in oncology generally. I'll talk just briefly about one of these targets. Um, CD276 is also known as B7H3. We've been really interested in, in a, a drug that's come forward from Daiichi targeting this. Um, this is from phase one. You can just, I've circled the small cell lung cancer patients, uh, showing actually nice uh, preliminary response in, in small cell lung cancer patients. And this trial has just, has completed enrollment. This was a, a randomized trial, phase two, just looking at two different doses of this antibody drug conjugate. Um, Data is not yet released, but, but this actually looks uh, uh, preliminarily quite, quite good, and I think it's gonna go forward. Um, so we're excited about that drug. Internally at Sloan Kettering, we've been interested in DLL3 as a target. We've uh, generated a suite of antibodies against DLL3 that we've been using on the laboratory side for development uh, of a number of strategies, CAR T cells uh, that we've published on, and, and in particular radio conjugates. We've been really interested in the idea of moving from an antibody drug conjugate with a breakable linker to a uh, radio conjugate with an unbreakable linker. Small cell lung cancer is a super radiosensitive tumor. So we cure about a third of the patients with limited stage small cell lung cancer when we give chemo with radiation. We don't cure anybody with chemo alone. So the radiation is really key for this tumor type. And I think because of the DNA damage response defects in this tumor type, it's just super sensitive to radiation. So we like this strategy. Um, as, as a potential uh, way forward. And there's been a lot of investigators at Sloan Kettering that have worked with us on this. We've developed kind of a suite of antibodies and, and uh, we think we have maybe one that we think is, is optimal in this space that, that we're bringing forward um, <coughs> and uh, uh, thinking about as a potential imaging agent and, and therapeutic. The nice thing with uh, radio conjugates, you can use a low energy emitter for, for PET scanning and a high energy emitter for, for therapy. Um, we took the ABV antibody, the stem centrics antibody, and, and radio conjugated it as sort of a tool compound and, and brought that forward actually to the clinic. It, it works really quite well. This is um, data in humans uh, looking at uh, DLL3 imaging by PET. 
On the left is a patient with small cell lung cancer. Uh, you can see this patient with many, many liver metastases, a spine metastasis here, uh, strongly lighting up with the tumor. We're particularly interested in it as a brain imaging uh, PET scan, you know, FTG PET. Not great for brain because of high glucose uptake in the brain, but with a DLL3 PET image, we can, we can really nicely see viable tumor within the brain in this patient, almost, you know, it's hard to detect on the MRI, hard to distinguish between radionecrosis and viable tumor. So we, we think this will be a nice imaging agent to actually look uh, at small cell lung cancer. This is a patient with neuroendocrine prostate cancer. When prostate cancer goes from adeno to this high-grade neuroendocrine prostate cancer, PSMA can actually go cold. Uh, it's, it's a PET marker that we use for prostate cancer detection, prostate-specific membrane antigen. This tumor no longer expresses PSMA, but you can see all of these bone metastases in this patient uh, are lighting up with DLL3 PET. So we think this would be a nice um, diagnostic uh, uh, for, for high-grade neuroendocrine transformation. When we switch from uh, zirconium for PET imaging to lutetium, uh, at least in mouse models, these are two grad students who've worked on this, uh, 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 in small cell or in neuroendocrine prostate cancer, we can completely flatline these tumors uh, and, and cure mice. You know, can we cure people? I don't know. Uh, but at least uh, this is looking quite, quite promising. And, and I would say this is actually, uh, so, th so this is with the, um, Stemcentrix Rova T antibody. This is with our own antibody um, looking at zirconium imaging. By 24 hours, we see really nice concentration in the tumor. This has nice biodistribution to the tumor, not uh, to other tissues in the body. Uh, and actually, we think it, it's probably superior to the Stemcentrix antibody. Here we are radio labeling the Stemcentrix antibody or our in house uh, antibody. We are seeing more durable responses with uh, ours. Um, so we actually think this is kind of interesting and, and we're pushing this forward as a potential um, therapeutic. So I'm going to stop there um, and uh, summarize. You know, I think I, um, I've shown you a bunch of stuff that, that's actually not published that's, that's cooking, um, but that I think is maybe of interest. Um, I, I hope it was of interest. I, you know, we, we're looking at these two etiologic pathways to small cell lung cancer that we think emerge in the absence of tobacco carcinogenesis. One, lineage plasticity that we're really interested in, further defining and constraining. The other being this transformation of carcinoids, which we think is actually a new disease entity. Rare, but pretty interesting. We think it may be underappreciated because targeted sequencing panels actually don't detect this chromothripsis very well. There's a cohort of small cell lung cancer patients, small but real, who get durable benefit from uh, immune checkpoint blockade. I, I think defining the determinants of that durable benefit uh, may inform strategies to better treat the other 90% of small cell lung cancers. We think MHC class 1 is actually one key target there. Um, and there's a couple strategies here. One is epigenetic targeting to actually turn the pathway back on in these tumors that have silenced this. The other uh, that's being exploited by the drug companies right now is MHC independent T cell engagement using these bispecifics. Um, we think that analyzing the cell surface proteome is defining new targets here. We think DLL3 is a particularly interesting one. I showed you some of the data with DLL3 directed bites, antibody drug conjugates. We're really interested in the radiotherapeutic approach. We'll see if it plays out. I just get to talk about this. The people that really do the work are mostly in the lab. Uh, this is my lab. Um, I have a fantastic group of clinical colleagues at Memorial uh, in the thoracic oncology service that actually bring things forward to the clinic um, for me to talk about. We have many, many collaborators. Uh, a lot, we take money from anybody that'll give us money. Um, and uh, happy to take any questions. Charlie, great talk, but I just don't want to burst your bubble. And years ago, I want to say eight years ago, we did a study with LSD1 inhibitors. Mm, I know that. And uh, we have the rare distinction of killing the whole drug because yeah. three of our patients, I think two of them are Simas, actually had terrible unexplained CNS toxicity and died within a short time. 
Correct. Something that's, that is that unexplained. Drugs don't but we're yeah. there's other I'm not saying inhibitors. just so I just want to <laughs> caution you. And we do see a lot of this uh, structural variations in the left small cell too, so that really chromatopsis adds to that. Questions? Nima. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's something we're really interested in. We, so HDX alone don't seem to play well in this pathway, but there may be combinatorial synergy. We haven't looked at that. I actually just proposed to a student to look at LSD1 inhibitors with EZH2 inhibitors. We also haven't looked at that, but I think that's, that's the obvious thing to do. Um, we know each of those individually upregulates class one. Neither one upregulates it as much as, say, gamma interferon. So we would like to maximally turn this pathway on. I think we can do that with combinatorial epigenetic targeting. So we're thinking along the same lines. I haven't done the experiment yet, but um, it, it, it's ripe for the picking, uh, and, and we're planning to do that, yeah. John. John. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so for epigenetic modulation of class one, you know, there's so many different genes that can make you more upregulated. It's like the mental image that can make trauma and stress more frequent thoughts and behaviors more drastically regulated. All the different genes can be dramatically regulated in this way. So so is there special genes that regulate or is it just not identified for all these class one inhibitors? We we were as you were surprised that all these genes turn on coordinately and that they all seem to be coordinately regulated in small cell lung cancer. Um, LSD1 is one factor. We don't know. I mean, there, there's probably a much more refined group of regulators that are, that are coordinately regulating this. Interesting you bring up class 2. I didn't present anything on that, but, but class 2 also gets turned on. Um, and we're really interested in actually class two presentation by tumors. I think a little bit understudied. Uh, we think of class two, of course, as being professional antigen presentation, dendritic cells, and that, and, and, and that kind of cell. But but actually, as you know, um, it gets turned on also in in some contexts in normal in non professional antigen presentation contexts. And and we think that this may also play a role. We haven't looked at much at the at the CD4 side of things, um, but I think it's also ripe for the picking. So the second question I had was too, is um, is there any uh, or any um, CD4 uh, ADC for GLA3? Um, so is there a big difference between how you control CD versus some other way of excluding those that are already on? Is it stronger in, in the study that have been done that says there are two controls that trigger it? Yeah, it was a cleavable linker, and, and Dan and I both have scars on our back from, from the Rova-T experience, but um, uh, we looked at two different linkers. So we initially thought it might be a linker problem, so Abby came up with a different linker that they thought was much more stable in circulation. It didn't matter. The PBD is just super, super toxic, and, and I, I, I think it's a renal toxicity, but these patients get anasarca. They, they get... Uh, every third space that you can imagine gets fluid, and, and steroids don't work. Nothing seems to work. They're just really uh, uh, unhappy, and, and it, you know, we can't redose the drug. The same toxicity was actually seen a bit less severe, but, but seen uh, with other PBD antibody drug conjugates by uh, Seattle Genetics. They had initially done the studies with PBD. I think PBD is just the wrong, uh, at least that, PBD is, is just, I, I wouldn't touch it again. Um, there's better warheads. There's, there's great warheads now with, uh, you know, um, Topo-1 warheads. Topo-1 is a drug we use all the time in small cell lung cancer, top, you know, uh, uh, Topo-Tecan, Arena-Tecan. We use those drugs all the time. So I, I think there's much better warheads.
Yeah. So I wonder if you have that salty fish, which is um, you know, known only to one set and also Brazil up there. I wonder if they mix this because the fish is not typically fish with one type of salt. For example, when you do a pesca with a with two Brazilian with Brazilian set, you start with one absolutely nice fish and some are salty. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think the pet can be a diagnostic, right? A and actually we think for patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer who have a dramatically growing lesion, you can pretty quickly assess is that transformation or not with this sort of uh, assay. We haven't proved that, but, uh, but I think that's a potential strategy. So for patients with prostate cancer where you're worried about neuroendocrine transformation, it's very hard to detect biopsying bones and stuff, uh, and so it may have applications there. You're right, there can be heterogeneous expression. One of the reasons we're interested in lutetium as a radio conjugate as opposed to like an alpha inhibitor, uh, alpha emitter, uh, is that it has a longer wavelength so you get some bystander effect. I think in small cell you actually want a little bit of bystander because there's heterogeneity in the tumor. Uh, it's maybe a longer detailed discussion, but, uh, but we've looked at both. Yeah. You know, we're running out of time, so we'll do three quick questions, very short questions in this order. We don't know, because uh, the models we've looked at are human tumor in mice, they're, they're immunodeficient. Yeah. It's a good question. Yeah, we haven't looked at it. It would make sense for a tumor that's markedly upregulated CDK4 to inhibit it with CDK4. We haven't done it. Uh, I have the last question. What about MDM2 inhibitors for these groups? Yeah, MDM2 inhibitors have been pretty disappointing as a class. I, I would say even in MDM2 amplified tumors. Um, I, I think there are there's better drugs now. There's still interest in MDM2 as a as a target. Um, but you know, I, I, it's been a little bit of a tough thing to target. Good, terrific, Charlie. Great work. Thank terrific you. Terrific talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.